Witam wszystkich po przerwie. Welcome after the break. It's uh, 13 past 11 and it's the second part of our meeting. And now I'd like to ask uh, Ms. Lizanne Havinga from the Eindhoven University of Technology to present her uh, presentation, Restorative Design Process in Polish Roots, a restorative process projectowy. So please share your screen and uh, present your presentation. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you're able to see the screen okay. Um, so it's my honor to present work group two of the Restore Action, the, which focuses on the restorative design process. Um, I would like to present an overview of the key takeaways of our work group, but especially I would like to also introduce you to our uh, some key contributes because uh, a cost action is really a networking action. So the idea is also that we grow our network and I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't want to only that you get to see my face, but also that you get to meet some of the people that were instrumental in our work package. So that's also what my presentation will focus on. So uh, first of all, the presentation is mostly structured around this book publication. Uh, the title is Regenerative Design and Digital Practice, a Handbook for the Built Environment. This is the final outcome of our working group um, and it, so it shows a really comprehensive overview of our activities and our outcomes. It has more than 60 contributors from both academia and practice. And I'm uh, proud to say it has already been read more than 17,000 times online. So you can also make that number increase by going uh, to the Restore website, and pub, uh, clicking on our publications, or going to Research Brigade to get the free download copy of this very comprehensive book. Um, the first chapter of the book basically starts where Martin, uh, who just presented, where work group one ended. Um, so the, it, it, it starts from these definitions of regenerative design and how to translate those to design principles. So the pillars of regenerative design were defined. Um, so the chapter starts from the context and the background of the Paris Agreement and the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Um, and the Living Building Challenge, and then defines three pillars that uh, Working Group three, 2 has focused on. The first pillar is focused on climate and energy, the second on carbon and ecology, and the third on human well-being. Um, in addition to these pillars, the, the focus of, um, of the how to, in, how to integrate regenerative design, how to integrate regenerative definitions in, in the design process is that you have to focus on the inclusion of science and digital tools, and in particularly on the integrated nature of restorative design, and therefore on the integration of a broad variety of um, disciplines and uh, the transdisciplinary approach. Um, the, the chapter also discusses some of the barriers to implementation in practice that are also discussed throughout the book. Um, and as the final uh, part of the book focuses on some uh, real life examples, so these barriers to implementation are also discussed there, where they have been overcome. Um, so this is also my opportunity to introduce you to some key contributors to the book who were also instrumental in this first part of uh, the three pillars of regenerative design. The first you've already met, so I do not have to say a lot about this, I think. Um, his main contributions are, of course, more from the um, defining characteristics of regenerative design, the concepts and the principles. Um, and for example, it talks about uh, e the transition from ego to eco to seva and donut economics, for example, as two, um, two critical topics that we use in the definition of these regenerative design pillars. Um, the second person I I would really like to introduce because he was also otherwise he would have been here presenting to you. So this is a uh, Dr. Emmanuel Naboni. He's an associate professor at the University of Parma and affiliate professor of sustainability at KDK. His key contributions 
to our um, working group was that he was also working group leader. But in terms of the content, he focused a lot on um, uh, the in integration of data and big data in tools. Um, so this is, for example, this image is uh, one of the data sources that he discusses, which is the global climate data and how to integrate that in uh, integrated modeling. And his um, focus is also on interdisciplinary modeling and combined modeling of indoor and outdoor um, uh, phenomena, so urban microclimate and how that relates to energy use and indoor comfort, for example. Um, and parametric design is also one of his expertise. Um, and then myself, <laughs> I, I am the co-leader of Working Group 2. Um, I'm an assistant professor building performance in Eindhoven in the Netherlands. Um, in the book I part and in the work group, my, uh, in addition to coordinating and leading the group, my main coordination, my main contribution lies on the LCA, life cycle assessment and circularity, uh, and on the real life implementation case studies and how and presenting those at, uh, throughout the book. Um, in my real life work, I focus also on the parametric optimization of uh, sustainability in the housing stock which basically concerns uh, models where you uh, model a very broad variety of solutions uh, and a broad variety of buildings and users in order to optimize solutions for the whole scope uh, of issues that we need to tackle in the building stock. Um, then the second chapter of the book uh, focuses on novel computational tools. Um, the main focus of this part is on the interdisciplinary evaluation of performance on parametric design in combined with optimization techniques, on the integration of big data, uh, and on tracking flows. And with the integration of data, this is not only the sort of data that you might expect, but that is very related to, for example, energy use, but it also is about uh, integration of uh, data concerning, um, for example, uh, ecosystem um, uh, related data and tracking flows of, of water and other natural flows as well. Um, the integration of these digital tools and big data is imperative in achieving truly regenerative buildings. And some of the people that I will introduce as part of uh, this book highlight this. Um, for example, uh, Dr. Terry Peters is an assistant professor of building performance well-being at Ryerson University in Canada. And as part of uh, the work group two, she introduced her work that she did uh, working at a children's hospital design um, and the way that computational tools help her to create spaces where, for example, not only the, the, the energy, but also the light and the other uh, and health of the building is really uh, highlighted. So for her indoor comfort and indoor health and in a very holistic approaching it in a very holistic way is uh, key to the computational tools that she uses in the design of these buildings. So as you can see, she designed, she contributed to the design of these buildings. So she's not just an assistant professor, she's also uh, an architect. Um, the second person I would like to introduce is Clarice Blau de Souza. She's an associate professor of design decision-making at the Welsh School of Architecture in the United Kingdom. And what she focused on in the work group is not only on the use of computational tools, but how they are, um, and what she also does in her work, in her broader work, is on how these tools are then used in a design team to support decision making. So she analyzes the way these tools are informing the design process and the negotiation between different disciplines and team members um, in, in coming to design conclusions, let's say. Uh, and then some uh, the, the third chapter that I would like to introduce is on climate and energy for regenerative urban design. Um, so it's about the local context, adaptation and resilience. Um, so the, inter the interaction between the local climate and the designs. Um, the, the aim is to optimize these different regenerative performance targets that relate to indoor and outdoor comfort, resilience to climatic events and heating and cooling loads. And this building in the background is actually also a wonderful example of uh, combining both a sort of a very a biophilic and uh, integrated design uh, in terms of the the urban design of the building but also using uh, bio-based materials and creating a lot of semi-indoor semi-outdoor uh, educational spaces because it's a school building 
um, and also the light in the building is is very um, is, is is very ex ex exceptional. Um, so this is also a wonderful case study where also a lot of uh, passive design and and, and energy uh, optimizing tools were used in the design. But in a very, as you can see, for example, the shading uh, devices that are used are in also in a very uh, local and bio-based manner. Uh, in in this chapter, I would like to introduce uh, Ata Chok Chokachan. Sorry if I'm mispronouncing the name. He's an architect and university lecturer, um, building technology and climate responsive design at the Technical University of Munich in Germany. As part of his one of his key contributions to the working group was the notion of doing a climate walk. Uh, as you can see here, this means actually taking walks through the city being um, equipped with a lot of sensor materials and in his walks it was not just about the quantitative but also about qualitative evaluation so in addition to the measurements and tools that he uses he uses actual uh, sort of the personal evaluations of people during his walk and in this way by having regular uh, regular walks at different uh, times of the day for example in different parts of the city identifying which parts of the city um, basically deserve some more attention when it comes to the urban microclimate and to me personally he used this also this approach in Malaga in Spain when we had a training school there and it was uh, quite shocking to see how during the same day during the same time of the day different parts of the city had a very different uh, urban microclimatic um, performance let's say and how these climate works were actually a really efficient way to not have to equip the entire city with sensors, but still to get a sense of the comparative performance of these spaces under different climatic conditions. Um, the second person I would like to introduce is Luca Finocchiaro. He's an associate professor, climate and build forms at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, uh, NT NTNU. Um, his contribution was, uh, were actually two very different cases. The one I have highlighted here is a uh, design for an NZEP building, so a nearly zero energy building um, at the campus in Norway, where um, both uh, passive design and renewable energy systems were integrated. But also, as you can see, the interior is uh, completely with sort of bio-based materials. So there was a real mix of uh, um, concepts that were applied here. Uh, but his second case study was completely the opposite, which is a sort of, um, I'm, I'm kind of struggling to find the name, uh, regen more related to regeneration of heritage, let's say. So how to uh, take existing buildings and their particular characteristics and regenerate them in a very sustainable way. Um, so it was a, a very different two approaches, but both um, with a clear, clear combination of having sort of the integration of energy systems, passive design, and a focus on the material use and the interior uh, experience of that material use. So there was a clear synergy between two very different cases. I'm just checking my time. It's going OK. Uh, the, the, last, the, second, the next chapter is on carbon and ecology in the design process, which of course is critical if you want to achieve a regenerative building um, achieving zero carbon or and zero energy and minimizing the environmental impacts that the building has is one of the sort of key criteria. Otherwise, you are not even allowed to use the term restorative or regenerative. It's sort of a baseline. Um, so the, this chapter focuses on environmental impacts and the way they can be accounted for in the design process. Um, in combination with environmental impact, the focus was also a lot on circular economy, because that's also, of course, if you look at multiple life cycles and the way that um, a life cycle assessment and environmental impact is usually only taking into account the impacts of a, a single life cycle of a building. But we have to start, start thinking in a multi-cycle environmental impact assessment. So that's one of the topics that's addressed in the book. Um, and the reuse of, uh, of, of materials uh, and the impact that that can have on the reducing the environmental impact. Um, in addition, of course, the use of bio-based materials is covered extensively. And when it relates to life cycle assessment, in addition to this multi-cycle and circular approach to life cycle assessment, um, we have uh, explored the integration of a life cycle assessment in the design process and also in the early design process, so how it can 
be taken into account from the most initial part of the design, even integrated in things like SketchUp, for example. And we've also explored uh, tools such as a parametric LCA, where you uh, compare a lot of different design options and alternatives of a building and immediately start doing an LCA on their performance. Uh, and in, in addition, we also focused on uh, LCA at different scale levels. So, for example, we have people in the group focusing on LCA at the urban and at the building scale and the combination of the two. Um, so just to introduce you to a few people in this group, um, uh, Catherine de Wolf is assist. I think she already switched to another university. So I'm sorry if affiliation is uh, the one from last month. I didn't change it yet. Uh, the, uh, she, I, maybe maybe someone knows where she went. I'm not quite sure at the moment, but if you Google her, uh, it's really worthwhile. She used to be at EPFL, uh, and then she was at the University of Technology uh, of Delft as an assistant professor of design and construction management. Uh, her particular focus is mostly on um, reuse um, of structural components. So for example, on the image you can see here is a stadium where she uh, has research the potential for reuse of structures. Um, and she's also um, therefore focusing a lot on this multi-cycle principle of environmental impact assessment that I just discussed. Um, and she's also worked on a sort of a benchmarking system. So one of the problems with environmental impact is that we do not really know which targets we should set and which targets uh, are sort of what would be a a good target for a building to meet of course that we do not that we would like to have zero let's let's keep it straightforward but she's working on a on a benchmarking system where a lot of uh, companies and, and case studies have already been integrated in her benchmarking platform that she developed as part of her phd thesis um that i think is very interesting for people that are interested to check that out um then uh then oh the next person i would like to introduce to you is antonino marfuglia uh, he's a senior researcher and, techn technolo and technology associate at the Luxembourg Institute of Science and Technology in Luxembourg, LIST. Um, he, is the, the focus of, the, he focuses on territorial LCAs of cities. Um, so he was focusing on the different ways that LCA can be coupled to GIS uh, databases to do LCAs of cities and districts uh, and the different ways that uh, the data can be uh, coupled to to the LCA, let's say. Um, he also worked on the territorial LCAs of not only buildings, but also taking into account very, a lot of other different material flows, as I outlined in the first that, that was pretty cool. Um, so basically on focusing on an, a full territorial LCA, taking all of the impacts of a territory into account. Um, then just one more example of the, the few more examples of the book I wanted to highlight. This is an example of a parametric LCA, where in the early design of the building, a lot of different variations, this is just eight out of hundreds variations that were done in this case, uh, can be done in order to optimize the, um, the operational CO2 and the material CO2 uh, in a holistic way. I am going to have to run to meet, stick to the time, I think. We started a few minutes late. This is an example of an LCA tool that's integrated in SketchUp, uh, Kala, uh, C-A-A-L-A. -A I also recommend you to check it out if you're interested. Um, then the last chapter was on human well-being via certification and tools, comfort, health, satisfaction, and well-being, and the meaning of health and well-being. Um, so basically comparing the reductionist approach, the sort of traditional approach, which focuses on um, uh, avoiding illness, let's say, or uh, the reduction of being ill to a regenerative paradigm where we are focusing on salutogenesis, which means the creation of, um, of, of not just health, of the promotion the pr to promote health, let's say, and to go beyond even health, but to focus on things like satisfaction and, um, and, well, and well-being, which is more advanced than just focusing on health. Uh, the chapter focuses on standard certification and tools, such as the well-building standard. And in, while the other ch chapters focus a lot on simulation methods, this chapter focuses much more on measurements and how, um, instead of only focusing on simulations, how measurements can be used to monitor uh, the performance of well-being and health. Um, so I'm, I'm, 
Angel Dr. Angela Loder, Vice President of Research at the International Bell Building Institute, was instrumental in this chapter. Uh, she, for example, outlined also the historical development of the notion of health and design and the, the way certification and tools can be applied and are useful. Um, Dr. Sergio Altamonte, Professor of Architectural Physics at the Faculty of Architects at Louvain, um, uh, focuses, focused a lot on uh, both the sort of theoretical concepts and definitions of health, well-being, satisfaction, but also on how they can be translated into, into uh, measurement techniques and very uh, yeah, a novel vision of how to apply that to indoor comfort and indoor health. Um, the chapter is also full, oh, this slide is not, this slide is in the wrong chapter, I'm sorry. This should be in the climate um, climate and uh, energy chapter. So these are advanced er, methods, but I, my time is up. I will not show you, but it's just a teaser for the book again. Um, and then lastly, the book shows some real life implementation where multiple pillars that I just presented are covered by these case studies in reality and to connect the case studies to theory and also to derive theory from the case studies. So just a peek at some of the real life cases that are really achieving the regenerative targets in practice are discussed at the end of the book to show that this is not just uh, theory, but it is already practice. So we should really strive to make this uh, practice everywhere. Some, and also we focus on the computational uh, tools that are used in the design process of these and of these examples from practice. Thank you for your quest for your attention. I'm happy to share this. Uh, please reach out if you have any any further questions. Thank you very much for your presentation. There were case studies at the end, which is just great for from very inspiring illustration on the uh, theoretical part and, uh, and the part on the program. Again, my interest from the architect's point of view is in the buildings that are already created uh, using the principles and the ideas that we are discussing today. I invite now Karsten Drumann to take the floor. The presentation will be on restorative building and operations. I think it is worth emphasizing the participation of people who uh, are dealing with restoration of buildings is immense. This stage is often overlooked and not addressed enough. That includes certifications uh, or designers. Uh, the design, designs that are just uh, commissioned very often are just left. But there are reserves to, to be used in terms of um, energy resources for exploitation, um, for to, to set uh, the building to be correctly used and to generate good habits. I'm looking forward to this presentation. So thank you, thank you very much, and uh, hello everybody. I started to share the screen. Uh, it seems to work great. Um, it's a pleasure for me to um, represent and talk a couple of minutes about th the activities and the outcome of King Group 3 uh, called Regenerative Construction Operation. My name is Carsten Drummen. Um, I'm working as a researcher and lecturer, lecturer for the Institute of Facility Management at the University of Applied Sciences, Zurich, um, Switzerland, and I'm leading the competency group Real Estate Management. Um, uh, I was acting as a vice lead for the working group three uh, with our head uh, Julia Peretti from Werner Sobeck Architects in, in Stuttgart, and um, I would like to thank all of, of my colleagues uh, um, for their distribution uh, to this working group three uh, right here at the beginning. <clears throat> so um, our leading questions um, have been 
um, how can a building be built and operated in a regenerative way um, in general, um, and how it uh, could uh, follow the regenerative principles being integrated in the construction and operation process, and even including demolition at the end, and um, how to realize a paradigm shift or to foster it from business as usual. Um, um, it's maybe a a little bit too uh, too hard to say, but um, the construction and real estate industry is not uh, so known for its innovative, uh, um, yeah, movements and and innovation innovation processes at all. So, how to foster it uh, to to push it into a regenerative construction um, process? These have been our lead questions and. Um, we um, thought about how to organize our working group and, and to structure the topic at all, um, the regenerative principles throughout the whole building life cycle. Um, I guess this makes sense at all um, because um, we have to take the um, whole building life cycle into conclusion to draw uh, decisions and uh, making decisions and so on. So um, we um, divided us up um, into four subgroups, um, procurement, construction, operation, maintenance and future life. We um, especially called it not demolition because um, the um, today's buildings, built environment might be a valuable resource uh, for the future regarding materials and resources at all. Um, so um, procurement is the um, uh, first stage to, to consider what follows in the design stage and operation stage, of course, construction. And then it can to, in can be, uh, take a, took a look at the whole process of bidding, tendering, and the procurement um, at the end, because um, the solution is uh, to have the end in mind when you start into uh, construction building processes. The construction phase itself, um, from starting from the preparation of the site uh, to the site management, um, including all the used um, buildings, uh, the building materials and technologies during the construction process. And um, then we have the step in the life cycle uh, for, yeah, in form of an, uh, some kind of handover um, to the operation and maintenance phase. Um, this is a very important step I may add here. Um, this is important in, in regards of, in terms of uh, a proper building document, documentation. Some people are talking about an s documentation, but this is the, would be the 100% idea. But uh, we would be very happy to, to um, come to a stage of, of 80% plus, maybe. Next step, uh, or next subtopic, operation and maintenance. Starting from commissioning, all the services <clears throat> needed to, to operate and run the building and to use it, of course, uh, up to the operation and maintenance of the building. And the uh, fourth group, subgroup, uh, future life, considering what is happening to the building after its preliminary uh, life, including refurbishment processes, retrofitting, reuse, adaptation in any kind. And in the worst case, or maybe not in the worst case, but uh, this demolition and dismantling um, at the end of the life cycle. So, um, Started, we started with some, some in-depth research and the findings has been as follows. Um, we identified three major challenges um, of transforming the construction and real estate industry uh, during the main stages of the life cycle of the building. Um, these three are uh, as follows. Um, there's a lack uh, or steps to be taken to achieve this generative approach. Um, first is uh, construction strategies, so as a lack. Um, and I may add here um, often uh, a real real estate uh, strategy in, in companies uh, and the corporate is missing uh, even today. Uh, second um, part um, is facility management itself, so the operation phase. And the third one is how to deal with historic buildings and the existing building stock at all or in total, you know, so-called built environment in the environment context. So um, I would like to address all these um, three or four subgroup topics in the next slides and then have a spotlight on the facility management topic. Um, <clears throat> 
the first one I mentioned was construction strategies. Um, currently, the construction sector is one of the industries generating the greatest envir environmental impact and uh, consuming uh, most of the resources, water, sand, and so on. Um, and therefore, it increases pollution and thus natural disasters occurring due to climate change. Using regenerative materials and regenerative technologies and um, encouraging all the stakeholders uh, included in the construction sector um, to foster them to move further on to, to start um, a shift from implementing degenerative or less bad strategies to other strategies that could provide a positive net environmental impact. Second challenge we um, identified, as I mentioned a couple of seconds before, was the facility man uh, management industry and uh, all its stakeholders. And service uh, providers and staff, it's always the owners and users and facility management. So it's not true, so I'm going to try it here. You have to get to balance it. And um, what we um, um, yeah, from pronounce or uh, we would like to see is a shift from this classic facility management approach in, in, in one single building or the focus of single buildings towards some kind of an urban facility management approach. Um, so uh, what does it mean? Um, the importance um, of the usage of phase of along the life cycle of the built environment and solutions in the sustainable and then regenerative management of properties and neighborhoods, uh, there would be a strong need um, to achieve these goals we addressed in uh, this action. Also facility management during planning and construction is well known. Um, but it's not it's still not applied frequently enough. <clears throat> and users and operators processes should be considered, simulated and optimized, uh, including measures that seem simple, such as an efficient way of uh, putting new buildings or buildings, existing buildings that have been renovated to the core and back to uh, operation. I will have another um, couple of slides regarding facility management in the next minutes. Third one. Um, have been um, the um, <clears throat> historic, how to deal with historic buildings and existing building stock. And um, there we have a need to shift uh, from degenerative drivers only in new buildings. And uh, I mean, all the, uh, the most of the as buildings and, and spaces already exist. So um, the, the part of the uh, new developments in the real estate industry is quite low. Um, so therefore it's very worthy um, to have a look at the <coughs> uh, built environment and existing building stock. And this includes, of course, the historic buildings as well. And these could, be, uh, could become a driver um, for generative sustainability. The so heritage adaptation is an effective strategy to trigger climate change action and community resilience. Um, um, this was one of the findings and outcomes of the UN's 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Um, the built environment professions are urged to reflect uh, on the potential impacts on heritage buildings, which may already be subject to strong pressure and risks related to uh, decay, lack of maintenance and redundancy on top of other vulnerabilities such as hydrogeological instability. <clears throat> Finally, adjusted settings instead of factory settings of the building services, e.g. Uh, heating and ventilation, not only could save energy, but also increase your satisfaction and health and um, link to an improved um, indoor room quality. One need to take uh, to take a further step from the classic view in in FM and for existing buildings and indoor buildings in the neighborhood uh, should it should be extended to the neighborhood and in, even in the entire city. I would, wouldn't talk about uh, uh, smart cities here, but um, this could be one of the first steps to uh, get all the stakeholders involved 
um, to break up these borders um, from single building view. <clears throat> uh, so um, at the conclusion, um, new processes, contractual models uh, are needed and uh, new management approaches uh, and change attitude of owners and investors um, should be useful to establish and to promote regenerative sustainability. <clears throat> So I'll skip this next slide and I would like to um, highlight um, the, the, um, yeah, the summary and the um, bundled findings of the working group three. It's included in, in our booklet. Um, it uh, has the same title as the working group three, regenerative operation and maintenance. And um, it's very worthy to to have a look at. Um, so and there, there in this booklet, of course, you can find all the um, contact details and names of the colleagues here who contributed um, to these uh, four subtopics. And um, if you have further questions, you can, of course, address and get the addresses and contact details to uh, the colleagues who have been active in the Working Group 3. Um, I promise to, to have a, a, a quick spotlight on the facility management um, situation. And um, from our point of view, well, the findings of the subgroup um, in this working group, um, we can see um, today uh, facility managers most only seen as a discipline that supports uh, the core business. This is a, even a, um, European uh, definition or included in the um, dedicated Zen norm. Um, and, and there's uh, still a thinking in, in silos for, for different tasks, which makes it very um, complicated or it blocks uh, to achieve uh, more ambitious sustainability targets, of course. Um, building operation is increasingly taken into account uh, during planning and construction phase, but there's um, still room for, for optimization, mm, I, I would like to add uh, here. And um, the focus on operation is mainly on ecology, uh, mostly energy savings. If you look at all these publications, um, I would say 90% uh, plus is dealing with uh, safe energy for heating, cooling, uh, or electricity in, in general. So um, this should be widened up to other aspects, of course. And uh, serious indications show that the interest of owners in sustainable, sustainable facility operation is increasing. And I can give an example from Switzerland. Um, we are running a um, certification scheme based on the DGNB, um, sustainable construction and operation schemes. And we have a, a really a high and, and a, a almost exploding demand from building owners to have a closer look at sustainable building operation. And we have a high demand for the dedicated certificate building in use in, in Switzerland. Um, <clears throat> what we have done in um, um, subgroup three, um, dealing with regenerative facility management, um, we uh, did a gap analysis of colleagues, of course, um, who contributed to this subtopic. And the findings are that there's the um, uh, so supply of the balanced amount of buildings for work and life, developing mixed use and hybrid facilities in the context of urban regeneration. Uh, this is what um, one of the major challenges will be, uh, the reuse of the uh, redevelopment of the environment and taking not taking only uh, the investor's interest uh, into account, uh, it should be taken into account the user's needs and, the, um, and really take the demand into account. <clears throat> so um, there's a gap in physical and psychosocial well-being aspects alongside compliance with health, safety and security requirements. Um, just have a look at school buildings, uh, today's school buildings and um, co um, CO2 uh, exhaust during, during uh, classes, during lessons, um, and, and air ventilation, 
um, built in, um, not as not since only uh, the COVID nineteen uh, pandemic. Uh, this is quite an, an uh, important aspect. So um, on the other hand, on the one hand, we are talking we are talking about energy savings, and on the other hand, we need maybe more uh, uh, mechanical uh, ventilation to uh, address um, and fulfill the user's needs. Uh, for taking this school example. Uh, another gap identification of different social groups and different social impacts, resilient buildings and resilient neighborhoods to integrate different social groups and provide synergy. This is um, yeah, maybe more city planning uh, aspect, but this is, um, of course, an, uh, an important point for facility management itself. And we need more communication um, to uh, promotes the regenerative values of users. Uh, this is increases the awareness of regenerative actions at all. Um, the gap analysis for the ecological targets, uh, it's a little bit longer. And um, uh, the next big thing, uh, so to say, is uh, the circular economy uh, approach for existing buildings. Uh, we can see um, databases like Modesta coming up and so on. And, and this is, maybe we are talking about, um, about buildings as a, a source of resources in the future. Um, so you need documentation, you need proper um, maintenance of the building data for just a sub, sub uh, uh, topic maybe, but this is one uh, facility management should care for. And, um, at all, I cannot address all these bullet points here today. Um, but one very important point is um, the reduction of space uh, consumption. And um, coming from um, or being employee of, uh, of a university, um, everybody knows that uh, during the off season, um, the, the rooms are not used. So the rate of usage is, is very, very low and we consume quite a lot of space and um, yeah maybe with uh, the uh, hybrid uh, or blended learning approaches uh, we, there could be a deal to reduce space in, in this kind of sector um, and the gap analysis for economic targets um, there are still two not too many investors and building owners um, focusing on life cycle costs. Um, I mean, in Switzerland, they have, for years now, we have some kind of a guideline um, as an example for life cycle costing, but it's still um, not solved um, how to compare life cycle costs between different building owners and their buildings. Um, uh, there are some, some issues here and challenges and some um, yeah, some some hurdles uh, to to share data and information and exchanges and to build up benchmarking systems. Um, so there could be some some work done in this field here. The outlook um, towards a regenerative facility management. Um, put all our findings uh, here together. Try to put it into into one slide. Um, showing um, guidelines for more well, guidelines. You can find the text, the guidelines, and in our booklet. This is the uh, e um, extract here, um, um, coming from current situation to the promoted uh, targets guidelines for change. Um, from going from scheduled maintenance to on-demand maintenance, maybe including um, machine learning approaches using sensor data, AI, and all that stuff. It's not so new um, these days, but still not uh, established in the whole sector. Um, we should move from recycling only to self-sufficient solutions, from a linear uh, economy to a circular economy, of, of course. Um, we will see more, um, should use more artificial and human intelligence, maybe in hybrid uh, approaches and solutions. And uh, what we already see today, we have much more uh, active users than passive users. And this is quite a nice movement and development. And um, we should foster this with uh, further activities. 
and we should um, focus on uh, multidisciplinary optimization solutions. Uh, so moving from uh, just monitoring single indicators to um, an integrated um, approach, a different um, disciplinary approach. Yeah, um, I'm almost at the end of my presentation. Uh, staying in the, in, within the 20 minutes time slot and um, the outlook put together here in, in five bullet points. Um, we were facing um, a green regulatory, regulatory tsunami and uh, operations and facility management users and building owners and investors should be aware of this. Um, and we should really break up the silo thinking. This is my last uh, statement for today. And um, think about more about an, an urban facility management, um, more communication, more data information exchange, working together. This is the only solution um, towards uh, regenerative building use and facility management. Thank you very much. Um, and um, have a nice day. Thank you very much. Just as I expected, it was a very interesting presentation, particularly in the part that often is not uh, considered enough. And you have told us here about reserves that are often not related to investments, but they are rather largely overlapped uh, and not used. Not we, whereas they can change the situation in the buildings quite a lot. OK, let's move on. Thank you very much again. If you have questions, please ask them in the chat. I don't see any questions right now. Next presentation is, I invite Mr. Roberto Lolini from the Renewable um, Energy Institute, Rethinking Technology. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I do hope you can see my screen and the presentation. Uh, my name is Roberto Lollini. I'm the coordinator of the uh, research group uh, Energy Efficient Buildings uh, in the Institute for Renewable Energy at URAC Research. URAC Research is an applied research center already introduced by Carlo. Um, in Bolzano, northeast of Italy. Um, I'm going to present what we did in the working group four uh, within uh, the cost action restore. We mainly focused on technology, so how to practically uh, implement uh, concepts uh, and ideas and let's say uh, design into into practice. Uh, so. This presentation uh, came from different uh, uh, yeah, presentations, uh, and you, you can see the authors uh, contributing in a way uh, to the contents of the presentation I'm going to do. Uh, so our main objective, okay, yeah, uh, the main objective of uh, wor working group four um, is to explore the potential and the impact of technologies for a regenerative indoor environment in new and existing buildings. So, I mean, our first step was to define uh, regenerative, what is a regenerative uh, indoor environment? Uh, this was a, a sketch that we produced at the very beginning so uh, you, you can see these two scales uh, and from one side uh, the indoor environment uh, where we uh, let's say uh, pass the, the most of our time and uh, uh, the, the world on the other side uh, uh, providing us natural sources so what we tried to analyze uh, was how to balance uh, these two these two aspects so to achieve a very good indoor environmental quality from one side uh, 
and to use in the proper way uh, natural sources. So to reduce as much as possible uh, the, the, the impact from social, environmental and economic point of view, being able uh, to um, um, yeah, to have this circular exchange uh, uh, between uh, our built environment uh, and uh, the world providing us uh, natural sources. Uh, and so to, to, to enable, as I said, uh, uh, this continual uh, circular exchange. Um, we, uh, we defined uh, five uh, main uh, uh, questions. Uh, so the first one I already mentioned, uh, what is a regenerative environment? Then is it univocal or can have different nuances? Uh, how technologies can contribute to achieve a regenerative indoor environment? What is a good uh, set of solutions for a regenerative indoor environment? And what should be the environment impact or the impact in general of uh, a regenerative technology? So starting from the first question, um, we worked on key performance indicators uh, and in particular indicators able to describe the, and to measure in a way um, the indoor environment. So uh, the um, kind of indicator that could be used during the design phase and that could be also measured in the operative phase of the building. And uh, uh, we had in mind uh, uh, indicator able uh, to support uh, a radical shift uh, already explained uh, by, by Carlo at the very beginning uh, from merely limiting health uh, related impacts uh, to, to a series of newer regenerative performances. Uh, so improving building occupants, comfort perception and, uh, and health. Uh, so it's no more matter of saying, okay, uh, to try uh, to, to reduce the impact, but to actually and actively uh, work uh, in order to improve uh, uh, occupants' well-being uh, and, uh, and health. Uh, and so these indicators uh, should also fully embrace the meaning of health generation and well-being, as I was saying, uh, facilitating uh, the likely effects uh, and prospect uh, to achieve regenerative targets, as well as being measurable to assess actual performance of technologies. So something, uh, again, to be used during the design phase uh, and to be used to, uh, for the different uh, stakeholders and players involved in the design process in order to be sure what kind of performance uh, uh, we are pursuing uh, and uh, to be able to calculate this uh, performance during the design phase and measure uh, the same performances during the operative phase. And uh, we um, identified uh, mainly five uh, environmental aspects. Uh, so indoor air quality, hydrothermal environment, visual environment, acoustic environment, and human nature uh, environment. Uh, each uh, aspect uh, um, had some uh, sub aspects. Uh, so related to indoor air quality, uh, we focused uh, on contaminants and outdoor air, uh, then temperature, humidity, and air uh, movement for the agrothermal environment, daylighting and circa circadian uh, rhythms uh, for the visual environment, background noise level for the acoustic environment, uh, and uh, right to light, uh, as well as connect connectivity to nature uh, for the human nature environment. And of course, for, for all these aspects, uh, we would like to evaluate uh, uh, the occupant satisfaction. Uh, so we move from sub aspects to what I introduced at the beginning, the key performance indicators, uh, and we identified uh, uh, specific indicators. Uh, of course, we started with a long list of indicators and uh, we try to narrow uh, down the, the, this long list uh, and uh, at the end, uh, uh, yeah, we decided uh, to, to use a, a, a short uh, 
a shorter list uh, and uh, a small numbers of indicators you can see in the slide uh, for, for the different uh, aspects we, we considered. And of course, uh, uh, this change of paradigm, uh, so uh, from reducing the impact to uh, creating regenerative uh, indoor environment, uh, uh, put at the center uh, the occupants uh, and, and their well-being. So we uh, also uh, try to identify uh, in, the, in the literature and try to also further develop a way uh, to collect uh, uh, subjective uh, feedbacks uh, by, the, by the occupants. So I, I repeated several times, uh, we try to measure uh, performances from one side, this is the objective part, and we also try to uh, evaluate uh, uh, the, the, the feedbacks uh, by the occupants, uh, and this is the subjective uh, uh, part. Related to the measurable, measurable uh, parameters, uh, uh, we define certain thresholds uh, that you can see in the slide. And we also discussed, discussed uh, uh, quite a lot uh, on the uh, percentage uh, of uh, satisfied people. So th there was a more, let's say, radical position saying, we must satisfy 100% of the building occupants. This is, at the end, actually quite impossible uh, because we are uh, different uh, and there are different dynamics in different uh, um, part of the buildings. Uh, uh, so it is really uh, almost impossible to satisfy the 100% of the occupants. What we uh, set as a, our target uh, is to satisfy 80% uh, uh, of, the, of the building occupants. And this uh, 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 response rate uh, representing at least, uh, let's say, one quarter of the total number of building indoor environmental, uh, indoor uh, of building users. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So moving to the second question. Uh, so is it univocal or can have different nuances? Uh, of course, as I already said, uh, there are small and big, uh, uh, let's say, uh, nuances in a way. And I would like to read uh, this. Uh, statement by Cole and uh, Lorch. Uh, the built environment can be uh, characterized uh, as the embodiment of human values and ingenuity as represented by the knowledge and priorities of its creators. Further, the acquisition and assimilation of the knowledge to create the built environment are clearly shaped by a broad range of uh, contextual issues. So you can understand there are uh, different context situation and different uh, um, cultural and social uh, uh, conditions. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the several uh, boundary conditions you can find uh, bring to different uh, perception of the comfort and different use uh, of the buildings. And uh, uh, in the years uh, with the standardization process, uh, there's a, let's say, a trend uh, towards a, um, um, a certain uh, level. Uh, in this case, uh, in the slide related to, for example, indoor air temperature. But again, uh, there are different nuances. And so depending on different culture and different, uh, different context. And you can understand uh, this is for the air temperature, indoor air temperature that is uh, studied from quite a lot, uh, since quite a lot, uh, and for the other uh, aspects, we, we consider and the situation is uh, maybe more uh, complicated and heterogeneous than, than for the indoor air temperature. Uh, yeah, j just a, uh, a mention to culturally, this is a, an Horizon 2020 project in which uh, we are trying to go on with this uh, kind of analysis and uh, try to study and the, the, the different uh, cultural and, and social aspects uh, in Europe and to put uh, on a map uh, this different context in order to be used by, by designers. This is our 
tentative. And we are at the second years of this project is a uh, five years project. Uh, so in the next uh, months, you can also uh, download this, uh, this, this map. Uh, the third question is related to technologies. So how they can contribute uh, uh, to achieve a uh, uh, regenerative indoor environment and how we can assess uh, the, the performances. Uh, of course, technologies are the, 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 the main elements uh, impacting uh, human perception uh, and uh, also the objective part. So the KPIs we defined and I presented at the beginning. Um, so introducing the technology, we move from environmental aspect to functions. Uh, so kind of functions, uh, technologies uh, um, must fulfill in order to uh, uh, contribute to a, a regenerative indoor environment. Uh, and so to contribute to one of the five uh, uh, environmental aspects uh, I presented at the beginning. Uh, so we, we defined the, um, several functions, so related to indoor air quality, how to remove and absorb pollutants, uh, how to change air, effectively change air in the room, related to the agrothermal environment, uh, provide the, the desirable uh, indoor conditions, uh, related to visual environment, uh, how to control solar gain, uh, and how to ensure proper lighting uh, for different uh, building uses. Uh, related to acoustic environment, uh, how to prevent or, or absorb noise, and uh, maybe in a new perspective, uh, how to enable uh, good indoor soundscape. So there are um, many uh, cases in which uh, would be better to open the windows instead of close the windows and try to insulate also from acoustic point of view uh, a building. So. This is something that, uh, I mean, we should mm, properly uh, analyze and study in order to have uh, the best control of the, of the envelope. And then uh, related to human nature uh, environment, uh, how to allow, uh, the function is to allow uh, view and light uh, and to include uh, natural elements uh, in the building. Uh, so, um, in order to achieve, uh, in order to yeah, to achieve these functions, uh, uh, there are uh, different uh, uh, subsystem uh, and uh, like the building envelope, uh, then the HVAC, uh, the, the active parts of the building, so HVAC, uh, renewable energy sources, uh, and and building control through a building management system, uh, indoor um, finishing, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, this is just the example of the envelope. Uh, um, the envelope, uh, you know, uh, has many functions: thermal, visual, acoustic, uh, and, and it, it it can also um, be used to to uh, to supply fresh air through proper openings uh, and need to be properly uh, regulated. Um, so. Um, uh, focusing on, on 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 the other part of the buildings, uh, uh, as I already introduced, uh, the 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 interior the interior um, elements uh, and uh, uh, the um, active uh, um, building systems. Uh, uh, in this slide, there's the distinction between building envelope and active building systems. You know. Uh, there's a, a, a tendency to uh, include in the building envelope also the active part uh, uh, to produce energy, uh, to distribute energy, uh, to control, um, for example, solar gain or to control um, air uh, exchange for the, for the indoor environment. And this is something related to the uh, adaptive or responsive uh, uh, envelope systems. So we try to create uh, at the end a repository of technologies uh, as a compilation of technology solutions and best practices, uh, um, a method to collect and select solutions uh, based on literature and 
also coming from experiences uh, and case studies uh, in which course participants uh, worked. Um, of course, uh, the repository is not meant to be exhaustive and is in continuing uh, update and improvement. And in, from April, we'll start a short-term scientific mission, one of the action uh, considered in the um, uh, in, in the in the cost action uh, to work on the repository to improve also the let's say uh, the interface in order to be uh, most more pro properly uh, assessed also by uh, external users uh, and uh, I mean this is uh, at the moment is a uh, an internal um, uh, link uh, and by the end of the of the cost action that is in a couple of months uh, this will be also public this is the actual uh, the, the the current shape uh, of the of the repository is an excel file at the moment uh, we are trying to assess, uh, to understand if we can move to a um, more user friendly uh, tool and this is just an example of a kind of technology uh, you can find uh, in the in the repository. This is a, a kind of a facet system uh, study in in Teo Delta and uh, let's say kind of work uh, colleague uh, Talia Costantinos uh, worked on. And yeah, uh, so. For example, for the envelope technology I just presented, uh, uh, this could have a. a could contribute to different uh, environmental aspects. Uh, um, so to air purification, uh, to, to uh, prevent heat losses uh, as a thermal uh, buffer or thermal mass, uh, and can also include heat exchanger of the HVAC system, and can also have PV panel integrated in the uh, outer, uh, outer part, as well as uh, the, the, the envelope can contribute to a, a acoustic insulation. So this is a kind of analysis we did for all the technologies we include uh, in the in the repository. And this is just an example. Um, yeah, uh, I already presented what is in the slide now. Um, and uh, uh, I would move to the assessment uh, of the key performance indicators. Uh, and as I said, there are two uh, main uh, main uh, topics uh, we uh, we try to face. Uh, so um, the subjective evaluation, so asking uh, building occupants uh, uh, about uh, their um, satisfaction, and then uh, field measurements through different kind of uh, of sensors. Uh, yeah, there are lot of uh, possible uh, measurement systems uh, for uh, spot measurements uh, like the blower door test as reported in the slide uh, or to evaluate uh, glare uh, or thermography just to evaluate possible thermal bridges or other uh, kind of issues related to moisture movement uh, and uh, uh, there's also the subjective part. Uh, I mean, we the, the the researchers understood that that the, the the standards are not successful in providing satisfaction because there's no let's say an average use that can satisfy uh, everybody. And I already uh, let's say presented our discussion on 80 or 100 percent to be satisfied with the uh, regenerative environment. Uh, so that's why we we also try to collect uh, and to propose a uh, uh, way uh, to uh, to consider uh, occupant factor in terms of perception and satisfaction and how uh, the occupant behavior can affect uh, the, the building performance. And again, there's different way uh, to 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 perform this kind of activity and you can find in our uh, in the working group for uh, booklet uh, all the information uh, to to perform this kind of uh, of evaluation um 
yeah, this is just an example uh, explaining how the different, uh, let's say, aspects uh, related to the indoor environment uh, can produce different uh, uh, perception by the users. So it is a, a complex uh, um, system and a complex uh, way uh, to analyze this system. That's why, I mean, it is important not just to measure uh, parameters, uh, physical parameters, but also to to collect uh, uh, the, the, the occupants' perceptions. <clears throat> Fourth question. Uh, so uh, what is a good set of solutions for a regenerative indoor environment? Uh, what we can, let's say, uh, propose uh, and what we define it is this atlas of solutions. Uh, you can go in uh, to the Restore website and there's a link and you can access our uh, atlas uh, and there are many examples of, uh, of buildings uh, with the specific solutions uh, someone already uh, presented and uh, uh, there are specific technical sheets uh, for the different buildings. Last question. Uh, so the impact uh, of the uh, of the technologies, we try to focus our attention not only on the environmental uh, uh, impact through, uh, let's say, standard life cycle assessment, uh, but also looking at the economical impact, not only the, the starting investment, the initial investment, but but also the investment during the operational and maintenance uh, stage, stages, as well as the residual value at the end of the of the cycle uh, before to starting a new uh, life cycle. And last but not least, uh, uh, the uh, kind of social impact uh, and then how to assess uh, uh, this social uh, social impact. Again, you can find detail uh, in the in the booklet. Um, this is the the cover uh, of the booklet uh, and you can download uh, uh, it uh, in the uh, restore website is I mean we try to be uh, as much as much as possible uh, very practical uh, very uh, inspiring for, for, for designers uh, so I do hope uh, um, practitioners uh, and designers uh, can use uh, uh, our booklet in order to be inspired uh, uh, to define a uh, regenerative indoor environment. That's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, yeah, if you have any question, you can, of course, I'm available. And uh, also the other colleagues are available uh, to answer you in a synchronous way through emails or other. Thank you very much. I do thank you indeed. I would pay attention to this repository of um, regenerative solutions that was um, discussed in this presentation. The more all the discussions lead to creating tools and practical guidance that may be then translated to physical events in the space, the more valuable it is and this presentation was really interesting. Now I would like to ask um, Jelena Brajkovic from the University of Belgrade, Faculty of Architecture, and her, her presentation will be on scale jumping. After the presentation, we will take a break. Please stay with us after the presentation. We succeed, we'll have a, a surprise for you that will be just one more point on our agenda. Jelena, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I would like to say hi to everybody. As announced, uh, I come from the Faculty of Belgrade. Uh, University uh, of Belgrade and Faculty of Architecture. I will be talking about Working Group 5 of Restore. I will be short and sweet as we are uh, a little bit uh, uh, running out of the time. So I will just introduce VG5 and its goals that we set and uh, achieved uh, during our uh, work. Just a second to share the, the screen. 
Uh, do you see my presentation? Hello? No, it's not visible. Now? No, yes. Fine. Thank you. So I will be talking about working group five. I know that you have uh, heard already other VG uh, leaders who talked very detailly about their results and the workflow of their groups. Uh, so I will not be uh, talking about um, very much into details about the result we uh, achieved in VG5. You can uh, download our booklet when it is out and read about it. Uh, you will see how actually we continued the work of Restore towards the future. So working group five was about the topic of scale jumping. Uh, and uh, we wanted actually to introduce the term of systems thinking into the regenerative discourse. As of course, we have many different uh, areas in which interventions could be done, but we also need holistic thinking and we also need and we also need systems thinking when we apply our solutions uh, to indoor, to outdoor environments, to the built environment as we know it, but also in, uh, how to say, some new ideas of reconnecting with nature, what the built environment even is and how we can design it, is something that we dealt with uh, during our working group. So we didn't miss any of uh, parameters that uh, should have been analyzed in order to achieve this. So we analyzed interactions between the triangular system, to which I will come later in my presentation. Then, of course, the tools, platforms and metrics, which go into the implementation of regenerative goals. Just to understand the workflow of Restore Working Groups, here I will show you the infographics that we made. Uh, for all our part participants to understand uh, how uh, the working uh, will be done in final year of Restore. We had a very specific situation of working uh, in a hybrid mode, which actually went to completely almost online mode due to the pandemics, which also introduced some new uh, topics into our, into our research. And the topic is all that you can see that arise from the pandemics and working remotely and the virtualization part and the physical parts. And also, how do we connect to nature in the environment? And do we feel healthy? Do we feel uh, good or bad? And how actually can we design environments? Uh, having something like this happening with uh, these pandemics, we really have to redesign and we really have to rethink how we design our urban environments. So the mission of VG5 is uh, the exploring sc scale jumping potentials for neighborhoods, uh, city and society wide level. Regenerative sustainability, of course, including analysis, solutions, and implementations. In one word, this would be the main mission of VG5. Of course, what does this mean, the scale jumping? In size, of course, so upscale, upscale area and the upscale reach, this is what we wanted and what we uh, were able to do, and in quality, of course. Potentials for new directions and interactions. Um, of course, we wanted to tackle the market and enhance market interest and develop, of course, interdisciplinary and intersectoral collections. As for holistic approach to designing built environments, this is more, more than important, more than, uh, how to say, in demand. So um, with Working Group 5, we uh, looked towards the future and what, what can we apply uh, to regenerative discourse, which we, which we can uh, which we can call the the scale jumping and the innovative approaches. So of course, VG5 was organized through subtests subtests where we had in first part, of course, the analysis of interactions, as you can see, between the old tree, human nature, and the built environment in all its let's say directions and sub directions, and then of course tools, platforms, and metrics. Uh, this you have have uh, heard from other VG group leaders. Is it digital? Digital tools for supporting design, smartness, emerging technologies, assessment ratings and diagnostics, performance indicators and uh, similar things. And of course, the legislation, uh, of course, the legislation, the area of legislation and how we can improve uh, how we can improve implementation of, of regenerative solutions to be actually uh, to be actually feasible and and uh, in in plan of all stakeholders in the process of creating, of course, the built environment. Outcomes, we had, of course, many different uh, meetings. We, of course, had uh, uh, many interesting conversations. We have the VG5 booklet, which is almost finished, and you can download it at the link Carlo provided already on the chat box. Um, uh, then we had, of course, even the sustainability special issue dedicated to the topic of scale jumping, and of course, many short-term scientific missions, of which 
uh, some are ongoing, and this is a very active uh, part of the project as at this part. I'm also SSM manager at Risto, so I will also dedicate one slide to this topic of very important uh, of a very important tool of Restore and uh, every VG group that exists in cost actions. So one also of our milestones was the training school performed in Vienna, where else, but in the uh, most livable city in the world, which already is voted many times to be very um, uh, to be very good for its inhabitants and really developing innovative projects that actually supports the good urban life, which was the topic of our training school. And uh, currently, uh, I am also on SDSM mission in Vienna, uh, deepening down the results and developing further uh, what we established as design frameworks for holistic thinking uh, on the one specific district in Vienna uh, in September. Of course, for the people, VG5 lead, Andras Wright, and vice lead myself, who am uh, speaking um, who am, who am now uh, taking this presentation in front of you so now you can see the booklet which is about to be uh, which is about to be published uh, i already explained the main structure of both subgroups and of course the 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 book itself so to further understand what what uh, the, the the structure of our work was you can see here the table of content uh, we don't have yet uh, finished the book so i'm just showing you uh, to interest you of course to download the booklet when it is ready and hopefully use some of findings for your own practice whatever that it is i'm sure you can fit in one of the of the of the sections uh, of our research and our results presented so it was nicely organized in first, uh, of course, understanding the interactions, then uh, then implementation sector, and uh, mostly tools, platforms, and metrics, and then of course the practical exercise of training school mentioned uh, mentioned earlier. So what is this triangular network, uh, the triangular nexus of human nature and the built environment? And of course, the scale jumping. So we approached uh, the, this, of course, uh, through the also the lens, of course, of, of, of technologies, because technologies is something that actually shape our built environment in the way we know it. First, we had, of course, the rise of printing media, which allowed, uh, which allowed architectural images to become predefined, which allowed, how to say, massive production and, uh, uh, and of course, uh, product, uh, production of, of buildings uh, similar and already designed in many different parts of the world. Then we had industrial revolution, which, uh, which provided standardized production and manufacturing, which resulted again in some, something like, let's say, um, visually standardized landscape. Uh, landscapes and of course some very uh, already predefined uh, processes for building uh, both the materials and the the structure type of the buildings so uh, we just adopted some 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 things that we could develop with our technologies and we didn't uh, think any further of how we can actually advance what we what we made and how we make it more make it more good for people uh, of course with digital and new media we go towards the stage of non-standard technologies variability emergent technologies technologies and organic forms, customization, interactivity, and digital is important participative design. So this is a game changer, of course, in how we approach and how we assess our, our built environments. And this is, of course, this tool section uh, that we can that we can further, uh, further enhance and that we are, of course, already uh, using widely. But do we have proper uh, design frameworks? Do we have proper holistic thinking to use these technologies in the right way? So our, our mission was uh, in a way to address uh, to the to this problem of uh, mediation of technologies. So not only technologies as tool, what can we achieve with these technologies, but what is actually a real consequence of technologies as we know them and as we use them, this global connectivity, of course, the globalization, the always on society, uh, then uh, a lot of things actually that we can technically talk about in architecture and urban design, but what does this mean really for our health? What does this mean for our bodies? And with, uh, how to say, um, let's say massive uh, virtualization of many processes during this uh, during these pandemics, uh, we again start to think and reinvest some of the biological, let's say, features of both of our bodies and our minds and what do we need from nature and how do we connect to nature now through another stage, uh, the stage after the rise of digital and new technologies. So where are we heading? Um, we can talk, of course, many topics here, but I'm just going to mention a few things. Uh, and this is the stage, of course, of global connectiv uh, connecti connectiv connectivity between, um, between societies and something uh, 
which we call a global society, where a society is less determined by objects and increasingly shaped by connectivity. With networks and high-tech environments, there is not, so, uh, not longer a there is no longer a binary opposition between town and country, urban and rural, and we can use this actually to uh, to reconcept some of our designs. This is uh, both uh, good uh, and bad uh, in a way, and many discussions can arise from this uh, uh, from this standpoint. And uh, I would also quote Roy Ascot, who even called connectedness a new principle of life, an evolutionary stage in the human development, which is, I think, something we all experiencing. And we, which we must use in our in our further advancements. But then, in in a state like this, how how actually uh, how actually we we ride the, the future of 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 uh, sustainability? By of course going back to nature, but in a new way, in a new way through mediated uh, environments, and of course something which we can call nature the second or the near nature. And near nature means, of course, a new way. Uh, in which humans connect to nature to, of course, everything we have developed so far. And to assist us in this, in this, um, in this progress, we, of course, uh, can refer to something called biophilic design. I guess uh, you all know the term. It is a new, it is a new, um, it is a new, let's say, relatively new uh, field of urban design and also architectural, which is, again, interconnecting many different fields for its practitioners. Of course, many many uh, both practitioners and uh, theorists in 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 theory of uh, media and technologies, of course, are again uh, trying to find the meaningful, of course, meaningful uh, meaningful uh, development of technologies uh, in a way that they can, of course, get us actually uh, back uh, with the harmony of nature, but in a new way. Of course, we have to be in sync with uh, with nature. This virus also showed us that it's uh, more powerful than we would ever imagine that it can stop the world in a way. It did so. What we can uh, what we can hope for is to quote drift, uh, sustainable, technologically supported, reconnected future. So how can we actually lead a simple life, uh, but through a highly mediated environment? It is possible. We just need a holistic vision. Uh, so this biophilic design, as I said, can help us in doing this. It has many different. Um, uh, principles, many different uh, elements and uh, more than 70 different attributes, which you can see on your screens. And we should use these attributes in uh, in uh, designing our environments through, of course, being uh, being aware of all the mediation that we produce or our needs, uh, both uh, our mental and both our physiological and both our uh, uh, physical needs, of course, of the of the space. Of course, we have here very, very, how to say, straight, uh, straightforward uh, principles that everybody can understand. It's like uh, having plants, of course, having the vistas of nature, which uh, uh, everybody likes, which nurtures uh, some very good processes in both cognitive and, uh, uh, let's say, psychological life uh, during the day for humans. But there are also some complex like attributes, like geographical connection to place, cultural connection to place, um, landscape ecology. These are all some a little bit abstract, uh, abstract categories to which designers really have to uh, to find their own way in achieving them and understanding them. It really, uh, the, uh, it really, uh, how to say. Um, um, it really demands uh, literacy, literacy of these issues for whoever is designing uh, buildings and, of course, the built environment. Uh, after Keller's table, which was produced earlier, there are, of course, many other influential uh, um, literature and approaches in biophilic design. Here I'm showing Terrapin Bright's green um, uh, patterns, 14 patterns of biophilic design, where you can uh, see them organized in uh, nature in the space, natural analogs, which is something also uh, used in many different ways, um, but um, not always so effective as it could be, and of course, nature of the space. So it is very nicely structured uh, for people that can actually use it in their practical, in their practical uh, design. Uh, after the biophilic design, I will go back to, uh, I will go back to, uh, the structure of our work, where we of course inter where we of course analyze uh, in a way through the uh, through the approach that I explained, this um, both uh, uh, bi-directional and uh, three-directional um, 
um, connections between human nature and the built environment. So the first group was really dealing with the most complex questions. And we tried to uh, approach this issue through, of course, analyzing some of the main patterns. Uh, and that would be a human pattern design, place and space, nature, energy, materials, education, equity, and economy. Many things were set through this pattern in the books. And I'm not going, of course, to, to to talk about all of them during this short presentation uh, when the book is out please refer to it if you are uh, interested we uh, we at the end um, forwarded some of the main interventions that we can that we can um, develop uh, through these patterns and of course a very interesting uh, very interesting concept of Restore 2030 emerged uh, as a result of the this working group which is actually uh, truly regenerative city, which could actually become uh, uh, adopting the approach of the work uh, from the cost action, embracing the re regenerative principles, mandative regenerative design, construction, and everything that you've been listening uh, from us uh, in uh, previous hours. Restore 2030 is also uh, becoming developed, and by the end of the action, this um, booklet also will be out with some uh, very interesting educational material for all for all actually stages of education and um, I again can advise you to actually uh, to actually uh, download this uh, and uh, further investigate on this as uh, this uh, should be in a way also um, uh, presenting some future directives where research after the restore can go so maybe a new project will develop out of this or uh, or or many other many other activities that can be happening around the restore 2030 then the human built environment interactions you can see here some some of the some of the topics that were that were investigated some of them very practical some of them more theoretic of course we dealt with health and the overall well-being which is very important topic of course and uh, through the nature and built environment interactions we had actually a completely different uh, approach through small urban hacks which can actually make a big impact this is very important topic as in many already existing cities and areas in uh, europe or whatever uh, we already have quite a defined structure and it is not going to change overnight so what can we do through small hacks which can actually uh, bring in um, which can actually bring in big results uh, for humans living there so it's something called urban acupuncture at micro intervention and um, it is a highly, let's say, effective approach to enhancing uh, uh, enhancing the life of the inhabitants in already built in already built uh, areas of urban cities. Then, after the the interaction section of all digital tools, this is something that needs no further uh, further discussion. Of course, link domains, multi domain integration, some very specific topics. Uh, where technology, of course, comes as a tool. And as I said, uh, we need a holistic vision to wrap it all together after this. Then, of course, smart technologies in the context of regenerative uh, design. Uh, this is something, of, co of course, which also is uh, like limitless, limitless, has limitless topics which can be, um, which can be further uh, analyzed. Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, big data, digital twins, many different topics then of course construction and operation emerging materials uh, information um, technologies for city models because emerging construction te technologies as i said it is a uh, it is a time of non-linear and, and very 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 uh, uh, very uh, how to say customized technologies that we can use for our designs also you can see here one very interesting example from the uh, from the research group, uh, 3D printed habitats uh, as uh, innovative eco housing. It is only a propo uh, proposal, but it can be a reality. And what we can achieve with this is really uh, something uh, we can we can be inspired by. Then something what I also mentioned earlier. Um, design frameworks, how can we actually develop design frameworks that will guide these technologies into providing us environments that we want. So you can see here some of the design and the frameworks that were that were investigated and of course, uh, the results that they showed and the discussion of, of their goods and bads. Uh, as final as as, as final um, as final um, uh, chapter in the to in the tools interactions and metrics we have of course a very important issue of 
legislations as it is very very important that we have this guided uh, guided development of future sustainable cities and and societies so here researchers uh, really again analyze some of the plans uh, of the european union and how this green transition actually can happen after this of course the practical the practical exercise that we had in vienna as i mentioned where we have you can see in numbers a very rich program where we have very nice trainees of whom i see now some are online and we are very satisfied with the results we get as uh, working groups uh, trainees uh, had very different uh, visions let's say holistic visions for the urban renewal of an existing neighborhood in vienna so here we also apply the um, holistic thinking through uh, both being sensitive to social cultural relations and the structure of course of 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 um, of social uh, of social um, uh, of social uh, parameter existing in the area then of course circular considerations and circular economy approach and of course biophilic attributes that i already mentioned through of course having also support from our international trainers for um, digital tools face impacts uh, carbon uh, ne neutrality and similar and uh, just to mention, as I said, tool uh, tool of the SDSM of this cost action, but existing in any cost action for uh, some of you who might be interested, we have no more or less but nine SDSM that will happen in uh, in still ongoing working group five. You can see here the some some of the of the titles. Uh, you can see that we have very diverse topics from some uh, some SDSM dealing with uh, energy, some with uh, the construction, and as you can see, envelopes, some with um, holistic urban living, uh, some with uh, social, economical, uh, and environmental engagement, smart city approach, everything what makes um, uh, what makes PG5, um, how to say, uh, one very up-to-date uh, up research group uh, uh, with, the, with the intent of trying to, to 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 look into the future and giving some some of the guidelines for future developments of sustainable built and regenerative uh, environments thank you very much for your attention and i hope you enjoyed my my short overview of working group five Bardzo dziękujemy. Tak. Thank you very much. We really liked your presentation. It was very rich and uh, uh, there was a lot of uh, illustrative material. And I think that we will really uh, enjoy going back to it and looking at the recordings. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Rajkovic. Uh, and uh, as I said before the break, I can see that the president of the uh, of the um, management, of the central management of uh, the Association of Polish Architects, Bogdan Nesikowski. So I would like to ask him to say a few words. Um, Thank you very much. I am don't, I'm not sure if I'm the best surprise here considering all the great, excellent presentations. And Piotr asked me to take the floor, and I really wanted to warmly welcome you all, both the speakers and the participants. And I think that these activities uh, within the framework of cost uh, program is a great experience for us. Um, we are extremely happy to be able to uh, have this event here in our uh, headquarters at Foxhall. Uh, behind me, you can see uh, the picture of, of our headquarters. Uh, I am now in Krakow, but I know there are a few people uh, in our venue at Foxal. And it's where the conference is taking place. 
Thank you very much for organizing this event. I think that within the discussion about the regenerative approach to sustainable development, it's extremely important to consider that we should really spread and disseminate the awareness of that. And I think that both our team of sustainable architecture and such activities like uh, Architects for Climate shows that we should speak more about this subject. Uh, in this term of office, the Association of Polish Architects has also nominated the Vice Deputy for Climate, which is Ms. Agnieszka Kalinowska, who is also with us today. And I think that talking about this matters is not only addressed to students of architecture, but also to students of other disciplines. Because in practice, we meet every day, and uh, well, uh, people have problems with even uh, taking care of waste with recycling and so on. And these are issues which are extremely important for us nowadays. I think that architecture has to change now in order to adapt to the future. I don't want to uh, go beyond the prescribed time limit, but uh, I would like to thank you very much. Um, I am listening uh, carefully to all the presentations. And I am very happy that the Association of Polish Architects uh, and the Warsaw branch can be part of this um, event. Uh, and I would like to invite you to the lunch break. Uh, we are starting our lunch break. Uh, it will last until uh, half past one. And I would like to invite you back at half past one.